hey, it's, it's only a few days till Christmas, so how many of you want to just uh, be honest now? How many of you are waiting on a present to arrive? You've ordered it, and it's supposed to be shipped to you. Raise your hand. Okay, I've been contacted to let you know it's not coming. I'm sorry, but, you know, they're just behind, and, and it's probably not coming. Hey, we had a couch delivered like 30 minutes ago. It was supposed to be here Monday through Thursday. Literally, they came up on Sunday morning during church and dropped off a couch in the lobby at the last service. I mean, it's crazy times, y'all. It is crazy times. Um, but, but, you know, maybe you're one of those people or you have somebody in your family that's really hard to buy for. You have anybody like that? Like they've already got whatever they want. It's just hard to get them. So Leslie and I, we, we come up with this pretty good little deal. I find what I want. It's been working for us for the last few years. I send her a link to it. She clicks on it and pays for it. And it just gets there. And, and so I'm kind of forgetful anyways. And so when I open my, honest to God right now, I have no idea what I'm getting. And I pick most of it out. And when I open up my gifts, I know there, it's going to be a surprise, and I'm going to be really excited about it because it's stuff I want. So that's just a tip for you for free. But you know who it really uh, would be hard to give to? The one person who has it all is Jesus, the Son of God. And he's the only person who on his birthday, everybody else gets gifts. And he's the one who doesn't get gifts. And so today, I'm asking you this question. If you're taking notes, uh, fill in the blanks here. What is the one gift Jesus wants from you that only you can give him? And the answer is, answer it out loud with me, your worship. Nobody can do that for you. You, you can't say, well, I go to Daystar and man, they sing the roof off the place. So I, that's my worship. You can't do that. Even, even these talented singers, like even they can't say, say you know, I sing so amazing because worship is not just your vocal ability. I, I've, I've been in ministry a long time. Actually, I was a music major in college. I know a lot of talented people who got it right here. Look at me. They got it right here, but don't have it right here. So it doesn't matter how it sounds. It's what's going on in your heart. And only you can do that. I mean, there's no, there's no money you could give, no talent you could offer that really becomes worship until you offer your heart to him. And so today, I want to look at one group in the whole nativity. They were the first people ever to offer worship to Jesus. And they were actually unbelievers. They were pagans. You may not have known that. Watch this. In Matthew chapter 2, the birth narrative of Jesus, it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during a time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And they asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to what, church? To worship him. So, so think about this. Think about the nativity. You've seen the nativity scenes. Maybe you got one at your house. And, and there's the barn looking thing. The animals are there. The shepherds are there. What, what, how cool is that? Homeless. The greatest king who ever was born is introduced to the world through homeless shepherds. That, that, only Jesus would do that. The shepherds are there. And then the wise men are there. And how many wise men are there? Three. There's always three. Now, your Bible never told you there would be three. Uh, I know that kindergarten song, we three kings. Uh, I know that. But it just never said it was three. You know, So it might have been three. might have been two. might have been 30 for all we know. They brought gifts. Uh, we don't know if they were kings even. But maybe they were. We know they were wise. We know that they were stargazers, astronomers, or astrologers. And something up in, their, in the sky, something deep in their heart told them, this is a big deal. And so they traveled across distant lands at a time when it's very difficult to travel long distances. And we don't know what they rode. I know what you're thinking. I've seen the nativity. They rode a camel. Maybe they did. I don't know. It's not written in there. Maybe they rode. Maybe they walked. Maybe it was a horse. I don't know. Maybe it was a donkey. But they went a long way in a time that was really hard to travel. And they did it for one reason only, to worship Jesus. There was something in the stars, there was something in the sky that captured their attention. They put their lives on the line because the King Herod wanted to kill anyone who was associated with Jesus. And yet something drew them to worship. Now when we think of worship, we think of songs and church. But the real word for worship, when it says they came, we have come to worship him. The real word they used was from a Greek language. I put it in your notes so you could understand it better. It's the Greek word proskuneho. Proskuneho, and it means to bow down or kneel. Literally, to fall flat, to do reverence, to adore, or to worship. These powerful, wealthy men 
literally were on their knees and their hands and their face before a baby. And, and the reason I chose this topic is I have felt like the word for December for us is the word peace. Come on, say it with me. Peace. And you know what we need more than anything else is peace on earth in our time. We need to be identified. The people of God are the people of peace. We're not turning over tables and burning police cars. We're not freaking out if our guy didn't win the election. We know who we know, and we know he's in control, and we have the peace of God. Can I hear an amen? amen. That's who we are, okay? We are identified as the people of peace. But here's the fact. You can't find peace in any other source than the presence of God. The peace of God is only found in the presence of God. And how do I find the presence of God? Here's the, here, here's, here is the one-step solution, worship. Your Bible says that God lives in worship. He dwells in worship. That 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the elders are, are crying out, holy, holy, worship to him. And so we want to get his attention because our guy didn't win the election. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. We want him to come show up because, you know, I need a pay raise or a promote. I'm sorry. God dwells in worship. So you put everything that is you, your opinions, your hopes, your dreams, you put all that aside and you say, you are worthy. And the Bible says God comes down and establishes his throne. Come on, everybody say throne. Throne is not just a big chair you've seen in movies. It means the seat of authority. He starts to establish his authority in your life when you genuinely worship. I don't mean sing songs, although it may be part of your worship routine. I mean to, to do this, to bow down your plan for his plans, to kneel your knee before his kingdom, to fall flat, to reverence, to adore, to worship. That's what we're going to do. Come on, everybody say, I'm ready. We're going to worship today. We're going to invite his throne into our lives. Let me tell you three reasons to worship Jesus this Christmas. Number one, we worship Jesus for who he is. Plain and simple, he's the son of God. He's just Jesus, and, and, and it's worth our worship. The angel said in Matthew 1, Mary will give birth to a son, and you're to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Yeshua, the Savior, he'll say, that's who he is. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet, a virgin will be with child. Nobody in this room was born of a virgin, but Jesus was. Who he is is entirely different from all the rest of us. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means, say it church, God with us. God with us. Now, you know that God came to earth. You understand the story, right? And you're religious or church people, so it's not crazy for you to hear God with us. But you need to understand that this was heresy in the day that it was first spoken. God is not with us. God is way up there. He's holy and perfect and righteous, and we are sinful, and the two don't fit together. It's like two magnets Back to back, they don't fit. And for someone to say, God is with us, had they had 24-hour news, the sports ticker would say, insane preacher claims God with us. <laughs> That's what it would say across the bottom. Because God is so holy and God is so perfect. And, you know, I, the, the, the Old Testament scripture says that if you see him face to face, you can't even live. It'll kill you because he's so holy. Isaiah said, I saw a vision of the Lord. I saw the Lord and he was high, Isaiah 6, lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple all the angels cried, holy, holy, holy. And then I looked at myself and he said, I said, woe is me because I'm an unclean man. I have unclean lips. I live among unclean people. He said, we're all unclean next to him. I, I love that Isaiah 6 passage because it reminds me that people who have truly been with Jesus, who've truly been in the presence of God, have no time or make no room to judge anybody else. And what are Christians best known for? Judging others. I wish that we were known for our love. That's what Jesus said we should be known for. We're known for judging people. Now, you can say I don't judge people, and, and I, I say too that I don't judge people, but let's be honest, the church has a problem of, of judging others. But you know what, what, what Isaiah, when he really got close to God, when he was really in the presence of God, he didn't say, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and I said, whoa, he's my neighbor. That joker's a sinner. He voted for the other guy. He can't know Jesus. He's gay. He got a divorce. He spends too much money on his cars, and he don't even pay his tithe. He didn't say any of that stuff. He said, woe is, come on, church, me. 
Me, I'm a sinner. I'm the guy. You know, what, what we realize is when we truly get a vision of how big and awesome and holy and perfect and loving and righteous God is, we look at ourselves and say, you know what? You might have issues. I just don't have time for your issues. I got to work on my own issues. You deal with your woe. I'm going to deal with my own woe. How many think that would be a good idea if everybody dealt with their own woes? That's what Isaiah said. Because God is so holy, I, there, there's no way I can be near him. And yet then all of a sudden, an angel comes along and says, yeah, you're right. God is way up there and you are way down here. God is perfectly holy and you are perfectly sinful and you guys can't get together. But guess what? I'm about to change all that. Now God is going to be with us. That was crazy talk to the first century believer. Even a high priest, the holiest man that there was, could only enter into the holy of holies, the presence of God, one time per year and actually normally one time in his lifetime. One guy's chosen for one day a year to go in there. And when he would go into the Holy of Holies, he had to be perfect. Pure in his heart, pure in his mind, and his thoughts, his words had to be pure. His clothes had to be pure. Literally, if he wore the wrong clothes, they weren't purified. Somebody had touched him who wasn't clean. He dies. He would die in there. If he himself were hiding sin, he would die in the presence of God. If, if, if he was born of the wrong family, he wasn't of, uh, of, of uh, prophetic lineage through uh, the tribe of Aaron, uh, he, he would die. And they were so sure of it that they would tie a rope around his ankle. And when he would go into the presence of God, and he had bells on the end of his, of, of his robe, and when the bells stopped ringing, they knew Joker fell over dead. <laughs> and nobody can go get him because if you go in to get him, you're going to die too. So they had a rope around his ankle, and they would put, how crazy, because that's how holy our God is. That's how perfect our God is. That's how unworthy we are to be in his presence. And the great God in heaven looked down upon earth, and he said, you know what? That's not good enough. I'm going to come and be with you. I'm going to be what you need. The Bible called him the open door, the only way to heaven. He's the gate that you can walk through into the presence of God. The Bible called him the, the water that if you drink, you will never be thirsty again, people. People are thirsty for uh, fame and fortune and, and for, you know, uh, love and acceptance that they never received and, and money and sex and drugs and alcohol and so many different things. God says, if you drink of Jesus, you'll never need to drink of all those things again. Church, he's every bit of what you need. And yet he said, I'm not going to stay distant anymore. I'm coming to where you are. And the Magi started worshiping him. Why don't you join them and worship him for who he is? Let me go ahead and give you a spoiler alert. I'm telling you three reasons to praise him, and at the end of it, I want you to do it. I mean, I literally want you to clap your hands, and I don't want you to do it, but like, okay, we're one-third of the way through the sermon. We got two more claps to go, and we get to go to dinner. I want to tell you right now, I don't know how to do religion. I don't like religion. I'm not good at religion. You're at the wrong church if you came to be religious. Let's do that somewhere else. That is a waste of your time. Why would you do that? Why would you go to church just because somebody said you ought to go and you want to you know, make people think you're a good person. Ah, I wouldn't do that. Just don't come. I, I mean, really, why would you give a little bit of money because you feel like, oh, I make so much money and there's so many poor people. I'm just going to give a little money out of guilt. That's religion. Keep your money. I mean, we, we don't, it doesn't work. Religion just doesn't work. It makes you angry. It makes you judgmental. It makes you feel guilty. It makes you feel bad about yourself. But on the other hand, if you believe there's a real living Savior who can come and change who you are and work inside of you, man, give him your life. Give him your world. Clap your hands because it's one-third of the way through the sermon. Clap your hands because he is the Savior of the world, and he loved you and chose you and accepted you. Let's try that one more time. Praise him for who he is. Yeah. Secondly, we worship Jesus because of what he's done. Come on, if he's done some stuff for you, say amen. amen. Watch this. 2 Timothy 1 and 9 says, he saved us. To save, to be, it means to be rescued. He rescued us. And he called us to a holy life. Uh-oh, I'm out. I can't be holy. No, keep reading. Not because of anything we have done. There you go. You can be holy. But because of his own purpose and grace. He has a purpose in your life. And this grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. It was already there, but now. Everybody say now. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and brought life. Now, some of you know he's done amazing things for you. But let me talk to people that are not sure about that. You're like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of, I go to church some, and I don't know that my life's any different. I don't know that I've had any big prayers answered. Whatever good has happened in my life, it seemed like it just happened, or maybe I worked for it. I'm not sure Jesus has done a whole lot for me. 
Well, listen, if that's how you feel, if you're joining us online and you feel that way, I am so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're curious. I'm glad you're seeking and you're figuring this thing out. But know this, he's not going to do anything for you because of something you've done. Jesus literally, it just said about Jesus that it was not because of anything you've done, but because of his purpose and his grace. He has grace for you and a purpose for your future. And you know what? If you don't believe it, he died for you whether you accept it or not. You know, whether, whether you think maybe religion is this grand hoax for weak-minded people, doesn't matter. He died for you anyways. And if you never, ever believe in him and you never surrender your life to him and you never love him and accept his love, guess what? He already knew that before you figured it out and he died anyways for you. Think about that for a minute. And if you live your whole life a skeptic, only to come to the realization at your old age, maybe on your deathbed, that God really is love, that he's really for you, guess what? He's going to be right there having waited on you your whole life. But why would you do that? Why not today, right now? Why waste all those days from this day to that day? Why not right now engage in the why he made you? It says here that it wasn't because of what you did, but because of his own purpose and grace. Why not find out what that purpose is for your life? Walk into that grace for your life. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And now is the accepted time. I'm going to need you to help me. Everybody say today, today. and now. now. That's what God says. When, when, when you hear a message of hope, when you hear the truth of God, there, there, there's two words, today and right now. That's always what he means. I got some good advice a long time ago from an investment guy. And one of the things he told me was, he said, you know when the best time to start planning for retirement is? I was like, when? He said, 30 years ago. And I was like, well, I missed that. And he said, the second best time is right now. I think about that when I think about this verse because maybe you have some regrets about some times in your past and you think, man, this is great, but you just don't know I've been too far down this path. I've done too many things on this other way. You're trying to get me to get over here and I can't be that kind of a person. Maybe the better time would have been to do something back then, but the best time is right now. Right now to say, Jesus, I'm going to take a step of faith and I'm going to trust you. God, I'm just going to believe that you are who you are and that you've done some things for me, even though I haven't embraced them yet, that you have grace for me, that you have a purpose for me, and I'm going to leave my rationale and understanding and just step into the faith that you're going to catch me when I take that step. And this Christmas, man, you want to step into peace, the comfort. I'm going to tell you right now, this has been, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, a freaky year crazy stuff, man. When, when somebody in your family's got uh, the fever, <laughs> you know, they're just like, I just don't feel too good. You're like, uh-huh, yeah, I'm praying for you. Way over there. <laughs> you know? I mean, you just don't know. Is my friend, you know, they just need to take their jacket off or they got coronavirus. Is somebody in my family going to die? There's so many, am I going to lose my job? Is there a stimulus check that's going to get? I mean, there's so many freaky, unexpected things that's just added to life's normal freaky stuff. Can I get an amen to that? Like there's plenty of normal freaky. You know, we didn't need 2020 to be freaky, right? But I've had an amazing level of peace this year. I mean, honest to God, y'all, I felt more peace in 2020 than in 2019. Oh, you just think you're holy. There you are up here with your red Christmas jacket on. <laughs> holy preacher. No, I was, I, I was kind of freaking out last year, actually, because <laughs> we decided to build three big buildings and do new stuff for our church, take big steps of faith. And then 2020 came along, and I was like, okay, God, you're going to have to do this. If we take out big steps of faith and I guess what I'm trying to tell you is there is a place of the peace of God that really is totally irrelevant to what's going on around you. And he's already done that. Come on, somebody say it's done. It's already been done. He already gave you grace and applied a purpose for you. So this Christmas season is about accepting the amazing thing that he's already done. So we praised him for who he is I want you to get you to clap your hands right now just because of what he's already done for you. Can you clap your hands for what he's done for you? Amen, Jesus, we praise you for that. So we praise him for, what he's, uh, for who he is, for what he's done. And, and here's the exciting part. Number three, we're going to worship Jesus this year for what he will do. How many believe he's still going to do something? Like he's still got something out there for you. Ephesians 3 and 20 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, come on, say more. more, immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine or think 
according to his power that is at work within us. Let me just, I'm going to read verse 21 in a minute. Let me stick on verse 20 for just a minute. Unto him who's able to do immeasurably more according to whose power, church? His power. See, religion says, I'm going I'm to go to church. I'm going to read about Jesus. He was an amazing leader. He loved the whole world. He was peaceful. He accepted everybody. And I'm going to try to be more like Jesus. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to change some of my behavior and, and be inspired by the life of Jesus. That's religion and that doesn't work. Because that means I'm doing it. But that is not what your Bible says. Look at it one more time. Now unto Him who's able to do. Who's doing the doing? Him. And he does it immeasurably more than we could ask. I'm doing the asking, and I'm doing the imagining. <laughs> He's doing the doing. And watch this. After the comment says, it's according to his power at work within. Everybody say in. Inside of me. The, the changing of me is not on the outside so that you can think I'm a better person, so that I can impress you, so that you can think I took up religion or I, I turned over a new leaf. That's my power working outside of me. No, the gospel of Jesus Christ is that the power of God from the outside came to work inside of me, and that is the only way it works. You're trying to make your mother happy by going to church. It doesn't work that way. It has to happen inside. If you're trying to turn over a new leaf and be a better person, but you're holding back kingdoms, your money is a kingdom, your personal opinions are a kingdom. Some of you, your Facebook and social media accounts, that's a kingdom. You won't surrender to God. you got to straighten the whole world out all day, every day. You look at it 47,000 times a day. You cannot surrender your, your life to God and hold in certain kingdoms. Your career is your kingdom. Your mouth is your kingdom. God's called you to be a witness, but you run your mouth off in ways that it ruins your opportunity to have a witness. This is right before Christmas. Why would I say something so mean and truthful? It's true though, right? I had a hard time, you know. I've told you about my battle, battle, my lifelong battle with sarcasm. That, I, I, that God has taught me that He doesn't want me to do it, and I've uh, had a hard time understanding why He made me so gifted at it. I'm really good at sarcasm. Not God's will for my life. I got to surrender that kingdom. And so when you when you start surrendering different kingdoms, then you start letting. Look at it again. Throw, are you put my verse on the screen, verse 20. According to his power that works within us, to him, verse 21, to, be, to him be the glory in the church. And then Jesus Christ, throughout all generations, forever and ever, and everybody said, for what he will do. I praise him for what he will do. He started working on me. And that little kid's church song I still hear in the back of my head, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him a week to make the moon and the stars and everything else. He's been working on me for a lot longer than a week, right? He can make heaven and earth in a week, but it takes him a long time to work on you. You just need to keep letting him work. And it's an exciting thing. You know, I I've always liked excitement. I've been a thrill seeker since I was you know, a little kid. I love fun stuff. Man, I rode my bike. We used to play this game. We had a, uh, an ATV. It was a three-wheeler. That's how old I am, three wheels. They used to make ATVs with just three wheels. Google it later. Put your phone down. Trust me. My cousin would drive the three-wheeler. It had a little sissy bar on the back, and we played a game. Who could hold on to that sissy bar the longest, not in the three-wheeler, but behind the three-wheeler? Okay, one cousin is driving it. The second cousin's riding backwards with a stopwatch, and the third cousin is competing, holding on and running. And you just run till you couldn't run anymore and fall down, and they would drag you around, and, and whoever's driving would sling you into pine. Children, don't do this. I forgot. This is not in the notes. I would have not done this. I'm in it now, though. Let's go. And you would just swing it around and try to bounce them off on the pine tree, and I won that thing. I started out by laying on my back behind the three-wheeler holding on to the sissy bar and just let them drag me all the way until the timer ran out. Now, when I came home, I had no backside on my pants. Totally gone. My mother goes to church here. You ask her if I didn't come home bare-bodied, uh, bare-bottomed. 
I've always liked fun and exciting things. Fast motorcycles, used to ride them in the woods and on the roads and, you know, love jumping out of stuff that you shouldn't jump out of and fast cars and, you know, sporting stuff. I still like fun sports stuff. I was out in in, uh, Utah a few years ago skiing down a super steep hill trying to go faster than everybody else. Had an app on my phone to show me how fast I went. Went several flips and knocked unconscious. I got a six inch scar on my shoulder and and body parts of dead people are inside my shoulder. I can't wait till the rapture. Like I want to see if all of me goes up or that dude his his parts go down. I, I've always I mean I like fun, exciting stuff. I told you all that to tell you this. The most exciting, unexpected journey in my life is when God calls me to do something. Following Jesus is the most exciting thing in my life. There's no way I'd be physically where I am today if I hadn't followed Jesus. This is not where I would have put my, this is not what I would put myself doing, this thing, this preaching thing. 100% last thing I wanted to do. But it's become the most exciting thing for me. I don't know what your thing is, but man, you will never have more joy and peace and excitement than when you just forget your kingdoms and your plans and what you want to. I loved Jesus when I was a teenager and I was in my early 20s. I had a deal with Jesus. I was going to make lots of money and donate lots to the church. And he's like, nope, you're going to preach. And I was like, yeah. But it turned out to be so much better than my plan. And I'm telling you, God's plan, there's something ahead of you. The Bible says, here's what the Bible says. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered in the hearts of man the things God has in store for those who love him. Pray this prayer with me. Eyes open, pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I love you. Bring it on. That's a good prayer. Say it again. Jesus, I love you. Bring it on. The Bible says you have never imagined what he has in store for you if you love him. If you're called to his plan, Ephesians 3, I just read it to you, says that God's able to do immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine. What I'm telling you is as great as the worship for who Jesus is, that's wonderful. As great as we worship him for what he has done, that's awesome. There is something he hasn't yet done in your life, and you can trust him. It's going to be good. It's not, I can promise you this, I don't know what it's going to be, I can promise you this, it won't look like the way you thought it would look. It won't be your knee-jerk reaction. You're thinking this, and he's like, no, do this. But if you'll surrender to him in in small ways at first, your faith grows. The Bible says every person is dealt a measure of faith, so you're born with a faith muscle, and it's very weak. And little by little, as you exercise it, it grows, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so you take small little steps. of I would have gone this way, but he told me to go, okay, I'll just go that way. And then he'll make you go bigger steps and weirder directions. And your faith muscle just keeps growing. And he takes you to exciting places that change the whole direction of your life. And along the way, he does, everybody say with me, immeasurably more. God, I just want you to somehow make this job work out. And he gives you a better job because he does immeasurably more. God, just please help us stay together until the kids are grown. And because he does immeasurably more, he turns your marriage into a second honeymoon. Because he does immeasurably more. God, could you somehow just get us to the place where we could pay the rent? And because God does immeasurably more, he blesses your socks off and you buy the house. You don't rent anymore. That's what God does. But it doesn't happen because you're religious and you take small steps. It happens because you completely drop your kingdoms and you give him everything. Let me read one more verse to you and we're going to close. This is about worship. This is a great... An old man, Paul the Apostle, who knew something about following God, he gives you advice. He says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer your body, yourself, your whole self is what he meant. Offer yourself, your whole self, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of what? Worship. Spiritual worship. Physical worship is the fact that I showed up, that I got here, that I sang the song, that I gave some money. Spiritual worship is what's happening in my heart. And the best worship is to offer yourself a living sacrifice. Have you ever done that? Have you ever just completely said, okay, God, all bets are off. Do what you want to do with my life. Take me where you want me to go. Redirect my steps. God, I'm, I'm the sacrifice. 
not the money that I put in the plate. I'm putting me in the plate, you know? We don't even have a plate, but a bucket. I'm putting myself in your presence, God. Not the song that I'm singing. I'm the song. Have your way in my life. That's what I want to challenge you to do.